welcome to our PACE informed and engaged lecture series featuring the distinguished journalist and residents from University of Delaware, Ralph Begleiter, former CNN world correspondent. As you can see on the screen and as you know from the uh, various things that would have brought you here tonight, he's here to speak on what they think of us and why it matters. My name is Sandy Pope. I am one of the co-directors of the Institute for Public Affairs and Civic Engagement here at Salisbury University. This is one of our kind of highlight events that we're bringing to you on this nice evening. Good phone ringtone. Um, and we're happy to have so many of you join us here in a nice, dry, warm environment to fight the rain. Please remember to stay to the end of the remarks just because it is raining outside and you want to stay in where it is dry. We are having a nice reception in the social room afterwards, so looking forward to everyone staying. Those of you who are familiar with PACE know that we do a series of events over the semester. Our next two events that are coming up will be October 19th. We are hosting a policing forum, and this is going to be um, an open forum involving all of the major law enforcement um, kind of agencies from the area, including the S uh, SBYPD and the SU Police Department. It's a nice chance to get to come out and hear from the police officers their take on policing and some of the key um, concerns that they're facing these days. Then on October 21st, we are hosting a local candidate forum just ahead of the November local elections. We'll have every candidate on the ballot in Salisbury, except for Jim Ireton, who will be here. Um, they'll all be here to talk, share their ideas about uh, some of the key issues facing the region and to hear and try to answer questions from anyone who might attend. So both of those events, the local policing forum on the 19th and the local candidate forum on the 21st will be at 7 p.m. in the Wicomico room in the Guerrero Center. So those are the remaining PACE events this semester. That's enough for me. I'm happy to turn the microphone over to Ralph Begleiter from University of Delaware who's here to talk to us about global perceptions of the U.S., what they think of us and why it matters. Thank you very much, Sandy. Thank you, Dean Pirabum. Uh, thank you, Sarah, as well, for hosting. Uh, thank you, Hong, as well, for inviting me in the first place. I really appreciate it. And mostly, thanks to all of you. I can't believe you're all here tonight on such a lousy night. I appreciate it. I think I can promise that when you leave here tonight, you will say to yourself, oh, that was worth it. So, you know, you have to let me know. Send me an email or a, a, a tweet if you don't think that's the case when we're done. Can everybody hear me speaking? Any, can anybody not hear me speaking? Raise your hand, wave at me if you can't hear. Okay. Uh, so I'll speak about this way. I'll stay as close to the mic as possible uh, so you can hear me speak. I'm delighted to be here at Salisbury. I want to send off a special salute to Pace, uh, whose mission is about civic engagement. And I think a lot of people think of civic engagement as being something like voting in the elections or getting involved in a political campaign. But I think it's about being a global citizen. And those of you who have come here tonight to hear about this topic, I know are interested in the global perspective. So I want to salute Pace for that. I want to talk with you tonight about a topic that, I'll be honest with you, is not going to be all that much fun some of the time. I'm actually hoping that some of this evening you'll squirm a little in your seats and feel a little uncomfortable and feel like, oh, that's pretty, hitting pretty close to the, to the heart here. If, you, if that's the case, then I think I will have accomplished my goal this evening. Here's how we like to think we are seen around the world. Just like the Barbie doll that does not represent much of reality, the perception of us in our own minds outside the United States doesn't represent very much of the reality. Yes, it's true that we are a free country, that there's a lot of free activity that occurs in this country. We can do what we want. We can say what we want. We elect our own leaders. We have the best, most well-trained, most powerful, military in the world. All of those things are true. They are true perceptions of the United States, but they leave out other pieces. Just a few weeks ago, I'm sure all of you will remember this, uh, three Americans thwarted a terror attack on a French train bound for Paris and received a very, very important award, the Légion d'honneur award 
from the French Prime Minister for having probably saved the lives or at least prevented the injury of hundreds of uh, French citizens and others who were on this train. And that's the image of us as a nation. It turned out, as we, we all later discovered, it turned out that those three Americans, two of them were trained uh, either in military or paramilitary services, and all of them were civically engaged in the most highly valued way. I like to think that if any one of us was on that French train, we would have done the same thing. Very likely, we would not have been quite well, as well trained, but we'd like to believe that this is how we are perceived around the world. When things hit the fan around the world, when a tsunami floods a Japanese nuclear power plant, or when another enormous storm floods thousands and thousands of acres of South Asia, the United States flies to the rescue, instantly providing food, shelter. In the case of famine, we provide uh, agriculture and, and uh, 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 water equipment, irrigation equipment, and so on. We like to come to the rescue, and the rest of the world knows that we do. Americans are among the most, among the quickest to contribute when a natural uh, disaster or a humanitarian disaster occurs around the world. We do have a problem, though, when people see us through lenses that are different from the ones that we use. A wonderful example of this occurred in the 2008 presidential election in the United States. In the United States, we all thought of Barack Obama as Barack Obama. In the Middle East, especially in the Arab world, but also in Israel, many of the people in that region saw Barack Obama through his middle name, which they perceived to be related to them, to their Islamic heritage. Obama is not a Muslim. He doesn't have Islamic heritage in that region, but the perception is what we're talking about. And I'd like to really make sure that for the rest of our discussion here tonight, you remember that I'm talking about perceptions, not necessarily about what's true. What we're talking about is how do people think of us and does it matter? Americans' perception of the Arab and Muslim world extends to our perception of the President of the United States. In 2008, some Americans were persuaded, just like the Middle Easterners that I mentioned a moment ago, that Obama is a Muslim. I got to ask you a question. I do not uh, believe in, I can't trust Obama. I, I, I have read about him, and he's not, he's not, he's a, um, he's an Arab. He is not. No, ma'am. No? No, ma'am. No, ma'am. No, ma he's, a, he's, a, he's a decent family man, citizen that I just happen to have disagreements with on, on fundamental issues, and that's what this campaign is all about. He's not. Thank you. Thank you. In 2008, many Americans thought Barack Obama was a Muslim and said so as they did in this live, unedited, unrehearsed exchange between the Republican presidential candidate John McCain and someone that he called on in the audience in Minnesota. After that episode occurred, and in the intervening years since 2008, I think a lot of us thought, oh, well, that one's been put to bed now. Nobody thinks that anymore, until about a week and a half ago. So, so I'm really honored by the crowd, and we're going to have some fun now, because instead of making a speech, which I've been doing over and over and over, I want to take questions. Don't we like that, right? Okay. All right, let's start with this group right over here. Come on. Okay, this man, I like this guy. I walk on White Plains. Amen. Okay. We have a problem in this country. It's called Muslims. We know our current president is one. Right. You know he's not even an American. We need this first question. This is the man. First question. But anyway, we have training camps growing where they want to kill us. Mm -hmm. 
That's my question. When can we get rid of it? We're going to be looking at a lot of different things. And, you know, a lot of people are saying that, and a lot of people are saying that bad things are happening out there. We're going to be looking at that and plenty of other things. Notice the difference in the way Donald Trump handled the question and John McCain handled the question. In 2008, McCain grabbed the microphone and immediately said, no, no, you've got your facts wrong, ma'am. Sorry, that's not right. And he set the record straight. A few years later, after most of us thought that issue had been completely dismissed, Americans are still thinking that Barack Obama is a Muslim and added in this little video clip was the perception that we have that the Islamic world is out to get us. Training camps, they're training to get us. Now, again, I don't deny there are training camps out there where people are out to get us, but our perception of our president is influenced by Americans thinking this way and by candidates for the presidency who don't correct the record. We also have news commentators in this country who perpetuate the problem. In 2010, uh, Juan Williams, who was a PBS, or, I'm sorry, an NPR commentator at the time, uh, said this on the Bill O'Reilly show. I mean, look, Bill, I'm not a bigot. You know the kind of books I've written about the civil rights movement in this country. But when I get on a plane, I got to tell you, if I see people who are in Muslim garb, and I think, you know, they're identifying themselves first and foremost as Muslims, I get worried. I get nervous. Now, I remember also that when that Times Square bomber was at court, I think this was just last week, he said the war with Muslims, America's war with Muslims, is just beginning, first drop of blood. I don't think there's any way to get away from these facts. So the, if you identify yourself first and foremost by your religion, it makes you nervous? That's the problem that I think I would like to highlight tonight that if we identify people by their religion first and foremost and it makes us nervous, that's not only a problem for us, but it's also a problem for people in the other part of the world. So we're going to talk tonight about perceptions of the Arab and Muslim world by the United States and perceptions of the United States by them. We're experiencing this very moment as we watch the refugee crisis in Europe Americans who are afraid that if we admit more Syrians to the United States under proposals that have been made by several people in Washington, we will be admitting the snake among the refugees, the terrorists among the refugees. That's a perception issue. We're not going to change our refugee policy because our perception is that if we admit Muslims to the United States, we will be admitting terrorists to the United States. As recently as 2012, I'm going to show you a little clip of video here. This video was produced by an American citizen in California. It, was, it got no circulation in the United States. Nobody paid any attention to it. But it did turn out to be circulated outside the United States. Just watch. Put off his arms and his legs, and then his head and do it in front of his beautiful wife, Sophia. <laughs> As you command, master. <laughs> a portrayal of Muhammad in a film called Innocence of Muslims. Every non-Muslim is an infidel. Their lands, their women, their children are our spoils. The production values in this film were so bad that almost nobody in the United States saw it. It was a longer film than that. I just wanted to show you a couple of examples of it. Who creates this stuff and why are they doing it? In this particular case, according to the Wall Street Journal, it was produced by an Israeli-American in Los Angeles who produced it in 2011 and then it was picked up in the Middle East in 2012 after an American Coptic Christian translated it into Arabic and called attention to the film, whereupon Egyptian television, one of the Egyptian television channels, picked up a clip of the film and aired it in the most populous Arab country in the world. 
وده أول مسلم من الحيوانات اسمك إيه؟ يعفور اسمه يعفور يعفور بتحب النسوان؟ يعفور ما بيحبش النسوان ما بيحبش النسوان <تصفيق> Across Egypt and across the entire Muslim world Innocence of Muslims, the film, the video clip was seen and, and spread around like wildfire, went viral, as you'd say, on the social media, all the way from Morocco to Bangladesh, a huge swath of the world, is where this was seen. Within two weeks, an American diplomat in Benghazi was killed. Later turned out the episode had nothing to do with this film, but it happened at the same time. And in a whole bunch of other cities, from Casablanca to Dhaka, demonstrations erupted across the world. In Egypt, police had to be called out to protect the American embassy in Egypt, one of the largest embassies the United States has around the world. In Lebanon, institutions of Western influence, in this case, a Kentucky Fried Chicken store, were attacked by Lebanese Muslims who were offended by the portrayal of their prophet. In Iran, already an enemy of the United States, it didn't take much to trigger a whole raft of new demonstrations against the United States. In Afghanistan, where American troops were still deployed and American diplomats still work, uh, Afghans were demonstrating against the United States, they were burning American flags, and they were attacking U.S. military facilities and had to be beaten back by Afghan forces. In Pakistan, an American military uh, out operation was also attacked in a demonstration in reaction to this. And even in India, where people are primarily friendly to the United States, American flags were being burned in reaction to this video that most Americans had never seen. In Yemen, the American embassy was attacked, and in the only episode of its kind, the U.S. embassy security perimeter had been breached. The demonstrators got inside the compound, and they broke windows. Fortunately, no one was injured or killed in Yemen. And in Libya, as I mentioned, in Benghazi, an American diplomat was killed. It turned out, after a further investigation, that the Benghazi episode uh, was a result of an attack that apparently had nothing to do with this video. But at the moment it was unfolding, and again, remember we're talking about perceptions rather than reality. At the moment it was unfolding, the death of this American diplomat in Benghazi was perceived as part of the uh, uh, Muslim worldwide reaction to this video. And if you think this was a tiny little episode that had no effect or made no difference, look at all the places that were literally burning in reaction to the display of a video produced in California that most Americans had never even seen. It was an enormous reaction. And I'd ask you to ask yourself a few questions. For example, if it was an American who produced this video, what was their motive? What could they possibly have been thinking to produce such an offensive product and distribute it and raise a fair amount of money in order to do it. Ask yourself that. What were they thinking? Why would an American Arab, in this case the Coptic Christian, translate it into Arabic and make it available on the internet in, in Egypt? Why would Egyptian television pick up the video and play it? The motivation for all of these things has to do with the perception of us, how we are seen by others in ways that most of us never even think about. We don't think people think badly of us for doing these things, but they do. Why do Muslims react this way when they do? Why do they burn down embassies? Why do they burn American flags? And if Muslims behave that way, would non-Muslims react that way? The Pope was here in the U.S. just last week. If people had been burning Vatican flags or something like that in protest over something the Pope said or did during the course of his visit, I think all of us would have said, that's over the top. Nobody reacts like that. It's not worth that kind of a, of a demonstration. 
And if you think about it from my perspective as a former journalist, you might say, uh, who has the right to make the decision whether this video stays up on the internet or gets pulled down off the internet? In this particular case, the uproar around the Arab and Muslim world was so enormous that Google, which owns YouTube, decided to pull the video from YouTube. It's not there anymore. And I would just say, excuse me? Google is making this decision? Who's got any expertise in judging what videos you should be able to see and what videos somebody else should be able to see at Google? Now, I'm going to try to uh, prevent you from drawing the conclusion that I imagine some of you probably have in your head right at this moment, which is, Beglider, you're pulling out isolated episodes. These are small things. They don't really have much impact. One-offs. They're not one-offs. In 2005, in a uh, Danish newspaper, a Danish magazine, they ran a competition for cartoonists, political cartoonists, and they said, who can draw the most offensive cartoon about Muhammad? And Danish cartoonists rose to the occasion, and they created a whole raft of cartoons, comics, political comics, you might say, that were offensive to Muslims. In this case, the cartoon is designed uh, to portray suicide bombers who have killed themselves and are appearing in heaven expecting to find 77 virgins because that's what they were told before they committed their uh, suicide. And uh, Muhammad standing in heaven saying, wait a minute, wait a minute, we've run out of virgins. You've got to stop engaging in your suicide bombing. That was the idea of funny on the part of a Danish cartoonist who answered the call for that comic strip. Needless to say, that too, that whole publication episode was enormously offensive to Muslims who reacted in the same way they did to the Innocence of Muslim video, Innocence of Muhammad uh, video that you saw a moment ago. My point here is that images that we think, you and I think, might be cartoons, nothing but a cartoon, a poorly produced video, no big deal, why is anybody getting upset over this? Images can have powerful impacts that we don't predict, we can't predict when they happen. And part of that is because of the technology of media today, and part of it is just because we don't think the same way people outside the United States think. So in December of 2003 and January 2004, when these images were circulated in the U.S. and elsewhere about U.S. military personnel and military contractors at an Iraqi prison torturing Iraqi prisoners, in the United States, we saw the pictures, we got over it, we moved on, we, we were engaged in uh, the war in Iraq at the time, but in the rest of the world, those images are still circulating to this day, more than 10 years later, the images of Abu Ghraib are still circulating in the Arab and Muslim world, and they haven't gotten over it. They haven't given up on that perception of the way Americans treated their fellow citizens in Iraq. Now, some of you might be saying, that's old news, 2003, come on, that's a long time ago. Nobody's still thinking about that. And besides, those were just a few bad apples in the U.S. military. Our U.S. military is the best, the proudest, the best trained, the most powerful, the most skillful in the world. Most of our personnel don't behave that way, and that's absolutely correct. Most of them don't. But in 2005, just a year later, the Pentagon issued its own report confirming that at Guantanamo Bay, American military personnel desecrated the Quran, the holy book of the Islamic world. It was a report that was originally leaked and eventually uh, issued publicly for all of us to read and, and we could confirm it. And it wasn't a report done by a journalist, it was a report done by uh, U.S. military investigators who confirmed what had gone on in Guantanamo. Later that same year, 2005, an Australian journal journalist took pictures of American military troops burning dead Taliban Muslim bodies in Afghanistan circulated the videos around the world. Most Americans don't even know that happened. Most Americans never saw the videos. 
in the Arab and Muslim world, those videos are still circulating, creating perceptions of the United States. In 2011, photographs taken by U.S. military personnel showing them boasting about having uh, killed Afghan citizens were widely circulated, not only in the United States by an American publication, but then picked up and distributed around the world. And in 2012, Brian Williams reported on the NBC Nightly News with video of U.S. Marines urinating on the bodies of dead Muslim prisoners in uh, Afghanistan. I think so. I'm not showing you anything that wasn't shown on the news here in the United States. And I assure you this was shown all around the world as well. And if you think that in the Arab and Muslim world, they're going to think highly of us after seeing pictures like that, you've got another thing coming. Conduct unbecoming indeed. One of my former students took a trip to Germany in July of 2012 and sent me this photograph he took, uh, taken at a uh, US military PX, a post exchange military supply store, showing a t-shirt that was being worn by US personnel in Germany. This is not in the Arab and Muslim world. This is in the Western world, which sends the signal to uh, Arabs in Iraq to stand back or you'll be shot. A message that the Arabs take and receive very, very clearly. Sometimes, I think, we are our own worst enemies. We throw fuel on the fire. Like this. In December of 2012, an American drone was brought down by the Iranian government over Iran, engaging in espionage activities. And when the Iranians took videotape of the drone, of the American drone, and put it on worldwide television, American officials dismissed it and said, well, you know, we do espionage all the time, which is true. We do it in Iran, we do it in a lot of other countries. No big deal, we said. But in the Arab world, in the Muslim world, that video was very offensive and proved concrete evidence, you might say, to the Arab and Muslim world that we didn't like them and that we were out to get them. We use a lot of, we've used a lot of drone attacks since 2012. And in public opinion surveys taken by Pew Research in Washington in that year, in other countries, Pew asked people what they think about US use of drone missile strikes around the world. And it shouldn't surprise you that in all these countries, a sample of countries that uh, Pew uh, engaged in this survey in, most people felt that they opposed the use of U.S. drones in those countries or elsewhere around the world. That yellow line is the 50% mark, indicating that all the countries with red bars that exceed the 50% mark means a majority of citizens in those countries oppose the, use, the U.S. use of drones uh, in missile strikes. So that has nothing to do with religion. That has to do with American military power and the use of American military power. We're mostly proud of it, although look at the top of the chart and you'll see that 62% of Americans, the largest majority in the entire chart, uh, favor the use of U.S. drone strikes abroad, but a significant majority even of Americans, 28%, felt that they opposed the use of drones elsewhere in the world. So that casts us in a bad light at well. Now, focus on the Arab and Muslim world for just a second. Lebanon, Tunisia, Turkey, Jordan, and Egypt, and look at the large majorities in those countries, all of them 69% or larger majorities who oppose that. That means every time a news article appears someplace in the world, or a video appears on the web, or on somebody's Facebook feed, or somebody's Twitter feed about the use of a US drone in a military operation, it's another chink in the armor of our perception in those countries. 
And so that brings me to this guy whom you saw at the beginning. And his, his little story is pretty short, actually. Uh, he is a, this picture was taken in 2001, just a few weeks after the 9-11 attacks in Pakistan, I'm sorry, in Afghanistan. I'm sorry, it's in Pakistan in a town called Quetta. He is raising money for people to go out and attack the United States. Photograph was taken by a New York Times photographer, uh, La Ferre. It became a famous photograph at the time, and it illustrates the fact that out there, there are people who are ready to seize on the negative percep perception of the United States and take advantage of it and get other people to, to attack the United States. So when I asked the question, what do they think of us and does it matter, you have a right to ask yourself, who are you talking about? Who are they? So I want to show you a couple of maps that are oddly drawn. In these maps, political boundaries don't rule the day. In these maps, individual countries are inflated like balloons by the, the amount of population that meets a certain characteristic. So, for example, right here, this is a population chart. It's nothing more than population, which shows you that China and India are a whole lot larger than the United States. No surprise there, right? And it shows you the relative sizes of the populations in all these countries of the world. Nothing special about this map except the unusual way the world is portrayed in it, okay? This is population. Now let's look at poverty. This is the world seen according to a measure of poverty, and I won't go into the detail of that. You can get the details on worldmapper.org where all the spe specifics of uh, each of these charts is available to you. They set a poverty line and they said, all right, how many people in each of these countries lives below that poverty line? And this is how the world looks. When you see a, a map like this, all of a sudden, I think, suddenly the we and they become instantly apparent. If you're talking about who's rich and who's not, you can pretty easily see that in this chart. The countries that are large and bulbous on this chart have large, poor populations. The countries that are thin and small are countries that are mostly wealthy countries. Now, here's the Muslim world. The Muslim world is reflected here in countries that, are, that, are, that show up large on the map. Notice how small the United States is, how small all of Latin America is. Notice how small even Europe is. Europe is that sort of maroon color in the center at the top of the, of the map. The dark purple country that you can't see the name of there because the, the font is, is dark, that's Turkey. It's in Europe. It's 98% Muslim. So it explains why it shows up so largely on this map. And if you look at this map and you ask who they are and who we are, it's also pretty apparent. Yes, we have Muslims living in the United States. Of course we do, lots of them. But by comparison with the bulk of the Muslim world, they are over there in another part of the world. And just for comparison's sake, just for the fun of it actually, I pulled the one showing the Jewish world. And so if you look at this and compare it to the Muslim map a moment ago, it's pretty easy to see the we and they in the conflict in the, in the Middle East between Israel and the Arab world. And it's pretty easy to see why the Arab world often chafes at the U.S. siding with Israel on a variety of policies. And again, I'm not getting into the political question of which is right, which is wrong. It doesn't really matter. What I'm concerned about here tonight is perception. Is there a we and a they? And I would say, yes, there is. A few years ago, I did a class with students in the United Arab Emirates. Won't go into the detail of all of that. But when you uh, take a bunch of American students to the United Arab Emirates, where virtually all of the population is Muslim, uh, the perception of the United States looks pretty stark. It's also true that we don't have very much of a perception of them. 
here's what the UAE really looks like. It's not a bunch of deserts with camels riding across it and people living in tents. They're just like us. They go to cabarets, they go to nightclubs, they dance, they sing to music, they use drugs, they drink Starbucks, they pray in churches that look a little different from ours, but otherwise pretty similar process, gathering together under a different religion once a week to express themselves religiously. Very modern infrastructure, modern roads, modern buildings. They have something we don't have. They have an indoor ski slope. You can go to the mall in Dubai and go snow skiing inside because they have enough air conditioners fueled by the money that we spend on their oil to keep the slopes frozen and you can go skiing in there if you want to at any time of year. Their shopping malls are just like our shopping malls. They have the same kind of brands. Oh, there's a, a slight difference. You're not allowed to kiss in a shopping mall in the UAE. Uh, you can't smoke there, you can't have pets there, you can't consume alcohol, um, and you're not allowed to skateboard in the malls there. You see people using ATM machines and vending machines, and when you look up close, you realize, oh, the vending machine is selling gold. They're buying jewelry from a vending machine with their credit card, right? Pretty wealthy country. But sometimes the clash of civilizations in the way we dress and the way they dress because of their religions and our lack of uh, religious imposition about dress can become very stark. And it's not because the women in the UAE don't want to wear those high heels or those short, short skirts. Trust me, they do wear them. They just don't do it in public. They do it in private. So perceptions are a two-way street. Just as our perception of them may be false, we may think of them as terrorists, their perception of us is also false. But the problem is, how do we deal with that? If you take any of the conflicts in the Middle East and you ask three different people about them, you'll come up with different views. If you ask an American soldier about it, you'll come up with the view of the US government whichever government sent them to war. In this particular case, she was sent into Iraq by the US government in the mid-2000s. In the center picture is a young Palestinian child who probably knows very little about geopolitics, but if you asked her about certain conflicts, she would spout out things that she has been taught in school, things that she's been taught by her parents, exactly the same way that we spout out that Osama, uh, uh, that uh, Barack Obama is a Muslim because his middle name is Hussein. And if you ask the elderly Palestinian farmer on the right, as I did a few years ago, who lives right on the border between the West Bank and Israel, just beyond the wall that the Israelis have created, he lives under a power line, an electric power line that goes right over his farm, the power towers are over there and over there, nothing on his farm. The electric lines go over his, over his head and they fuel an Israeli settlement that's within sight of his farm, but he doesn't have any electricity from those power lines. That influences his perception of the Israeli-Arab conflict. Now let's backtrack for a minute to 9-11. Some of you in this room are old enough to have remembered it and remember the politics of it at the time. And some of you, honestly, you were, a, you were around for 9-11, but you weren't thinking about the politics in 9-11. You were too young for that. Seven, eight, nine, maybe 10 years old, I would imagine, just looking at your faces. Uh, so these images are not something that you feast your eyes on very often or that bring back strong memories. On 9-11, on the day when the World Trade Center towers were attacked, before the towers had even fallen, so it's early in the day on 9-11, this picture was taken in Ramallah, which is in the West Bank between Israel and Jordan. It's the city where the Palestinian Authority had its headquarters at the time, a guy named Yasser Arafat, who was the chairman of the PLO at that time. 
Arafat wasn't in town that day, so he wasn't anywhere near these folks who are shooting their weapons in the air, celebrating, like they do at a wedding, which is a common custom in the Arab world, celebrating the attack against the United States. Photographers from my old news organization, CNN, were there taking video. Still photographers from Reuters, the Associated Press, newspapers were all there taking pictures of these folks celebrating the attack against the United States. But Arafat, the leader of the Palestinians, understood on that day, at that moment, under a lot of pressure, while the towers were still burning in New York, that the image of Palestinians in the eyes of the United States was hugely important. So within a couple of hours, he had photographers come in to take a picture of him giving blood for the victims of 9-11 in New York. Now, I don't know about you, but when I give blood, I don't invite a photographer in to take a picture because I probably don't look so good when I'm doing that. Actually, he doesn't look so good when he's doing it either. But the point was he wanted this photograph to be circulated in the United States so that the perception of Palestinians would not be the image of the celebrations about the attack, but instead an image of sympathy. Arafat ordered all the weapons confiscated, and he ordered all the videotapes and photographs and film rolls and so on confiscated as much as possible so the, the word wouldn't get out. The good news is my colleagues at CNN are smarter than that. They know how to take the videotape out of the camera, stick it in their crotch, put a blank tape in, and when the authorities come around to grab the tape, they get the blank tape from the camera, and the good one has already gone out on a satellite feed. By nightfall, on the same night, the night of the 9-11 attacks, our Palestinian children wearing I Love New York t-shirts were photographed lighting candles for the victims of 9-11. That's how important perceptions are in the world between the United States and the rest of the world. Why would Arafat do that? Why did he care what the perception of you and me was about the Palestinians on 9-11? Here's the answer we did not know at the time, and we learned it about a month and a half later, became public. At that very moment, on 9-11, Arafat was in negotiation with Colin Powell, who was then the U.S. Secretary of State, over an official U.S. acknowledgement, a public acknowledgement, which would have been a historic first-time acknowledgement ever, that the United States would accept creation of a Palestinian state, a nation for the Palestinians. No, it had not been made public yet. Yes, it was in writing. It was in a draft form. And Arafat knew that if the United States acknowledged the, the uh, right of the Palestinians to have a state that would be hugely politically important to him. And on 9-11, when he knew those negotiations were underway, he wanted to do everything to fix the image of the Palestinians so that Americans would not reject the Palestinian state. In fact, the Bush administration announced the acceptance of a Palestinian state about a month, month and a half later. It's part of the public record now and it explained in retrospect why Arafat did what he did on 9-11. First of all, I am offering my con condolences, the condolences of uh, the Palestinian people to the, uh, to the American President, uh, President Bush, to his government, to the American people for this Terrible act. Apology for or condolences over this terrible act coming from the Palestinian leader. That was an extraordinary moment on 9-11 and it set the tone for a lot of sympathy around the world for the victims of 9-11, which evaporated almost immediately when the U.S. started bombing Afghanistan about a month later on October 7, 2001. Once the U.S. started the attack in Afghanistan, in Afghanistan they were selling cologne with Osama bin Laden's name on it. Children were buying packages of candy with bin Laden's picture on them, just like your kid brother or kid sister would buy a, a Spider-Man uh, package of candy with Spider-Man or Superman on it, or, or SpongeBob or something like that. They saw bin Laden as a hero, not as a, uh, not as a victim. Of course, 10 years later, the United States found bin Laden in Abbottabad, Pakistan, 
captured him, killed him on the spot, and buried him very quickly. But what happened next, affecting perceptions around the world? We danced on his grave. Some of you might have even been there in Times Square or in Washington, celebrating the death of Osama bin Laden. These pictures, too, went viral around the Arab and Muslim world. And while most, and this is uh, supported by, by public opinion surveys that were taken at the time, most Arabs did not like Osama bin Laden and did not support his policies, they didn't like the idea that Americans would be celebrating over his death. Then, of course, there was the Iraq War in 2003, and most of you are thinking, well, that's over. Get over it. That's a long time ago. It was 2003. Come on. But we built an image in Iraq. During the first two weeks, Iraqis were throwing us flowers, kissing American soldiers. It turned a little sour later on when American forces began arresting, capturing, and imprisoning Iraqi citizens, holding Iraqis at gunpoint along with our allies, the Brits, and a few others who were allies in that conflict. Unfortunately, those images also circulated very widely around the Arab and Muslim world. Some of you will remember this day. Raise your hands if you remember this day. Okay, about a third of you remember it. Of those of you who said you remember it, how many of you remember watching the toppling of the statue in Baghdad live? as distinct from seeing the picture in the newspaper the next day or online the next day or watching a news report the next day. I'm asking about whether any of you saw it live. All right, so a handful in the room. You guys are my witnesses. I want you to stand up and shout, liar, liar, pants on fire, if what I'm about to say is false, right? The United States went into Baghdad and toppled the statue of Saddam Hussein in the capital city of Iraq. The first thing the United States did, and if you watched it live, you saw this, was American troops, U.S. personnel, climbed up a cherry picker, a ladder, to the top of the statue and put an American flag over the statue's face. Right? Somebody at the Pentagon must have been watching CNN or BBC or any of the networks which were carrying this live on that day and said, oh, no, 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 that's not the image we want to have. We're not capturing Iraq for the American people. Excuse me. And he ordered the Iraqis to take down the American flag and put up an Iraqi flag. And they did. Excuse me. <clears throat> so within a couple of minutes, the Iraqi flag was flying on Saddam's head. Which picture do you think the Arab media carried the next day in their news media? The picture of the Iraqi flag capturing Baghdad or the picture of the American flag? This happens to be a Syrian newspaper published in Damascus as an example, but the American flag was the image that was widely carried. What difference does it make? To the Arab world, it was another example of an imperialistic Western nation drawing boundaries, overturning kings, overturning rulers without asking anybody's permission, just doing what they wanted to do in their region. And again, I want to be careful to say, I'm not saying what was right or what was wrong. I'm talking about perceptions in the other part of the world. Here's how the Arabs saw it. They saw it unfold on BBC television. They saw a group of young men, probably in their early 20s, mid-20s, come into the square with a cameraman accompanying them to make sure the picture got out there. They demonstrated briefly, not a large crowd around the statue, just the people the United States authorized to go to that statue. They put up the American flag and within a few minutes took it down again and substituted the Iraqi flag for that 
for that American one, because the Pentagon wanted to have the impression, the image of the United States be something better, something other than occupation or takeover of Iraq. And this was a huge theme in the Arab world after the invasion in 2003. Images like these circulated very widely around the world. They showed Americans taking over Iraq. That's what we were doing. No shame in that. That's what you do when you take over a country. The guy on the left, don't have to say much about him. Anybody have a guess as to what the guy on the right is doing? Can you see what he's doing? Where's he sitting? He's sitting on money. He's in an armored vehicle sitting on Iraqi money. Now, our word, the American announcement about that picture and about what was going on in Iraq on that day was that our soldiers were securing the Iraqi financial system to be sure it wasn't looted in the downfall of the Saddam government. If you were an Iraqi, or more importantly, if you were an Arab or a Muslim living elsewhere outside Iraq and you saw that picture, I don't think it's a leap of faith to imagine that they would be saying, you see, that's all the Americans wanted anyway. They just wanted our wealth. They wanted our oil wealth. They went into Iraq to get our money. So the images that we see of an event like the Iraqi war are images of power, images of professionalism, our military forces training, our air forces bombing the city of Baghdad, etc. We show ourselves to be engaging in a sterile attack on a faraway city filled with unseen people. We never saw much of this on American television in a very dramatically different culture. Lots of mosques and minarets around the pictures, very different from ours, right? We see it as being conducted by well-trained, professionally equipped troops. And these images that we see are the ones that shape our opinion of the events of the day. But now take a look at what the rest of the world sees. They see images of Americans loading weapons on aircraft, taking over Saddam's palace in Baghdad, they see us bombing civilian homes in Baghdad. They see women and children running from the rubble in the attacks. And these images of people on the ground, real people, ordinary people, people who are wounded and killed, these images circulated widely in the Arab and Muslim world, and they form the image of the United States in that part of the world. The result of all that, from 9-11 to, in this case I'm going to show you through 2012, is our image stinks in the rest of the world. On this first chart, I'm not going to inundate you with a lot of data, but I would like to show you some. In this first chart, which stretches from 1999 to 2012, and this is all public opinion data by the Pew Global Research Project, you can look all of it up, it's all out there. It's actually an immense project that they've done over this uh, past decade and a half. I've put up on the screen some images just to remind you of what happened in each year. The 9-11 attacks at the end of 2001, the bombing of Baghdad in early 2003, the U.S. presidential election in 2004, the presidential election again in 2008, and the capture of Osama bin Laden in 2011, right? Here's how our friends and allies, and this is these, all of every single one of these countries that is going to show on this chart is either a military ally of the United States or, in the case of the Iraq War, a political ally. And that, that goes for, for Russia, which supported the invasion of Iraq uh, at the time. Here's what Britain thought of us over that decade. Here's what France thought of us over that decade. Here's Germany, Russia, and Turkey. Which one of these countries is a Muslim country? Only one, Turkey. 
Notice the dramatic difference in public opinion about the favorability of the United States, the image of the United States. Now, there's some nuance in this chart that you, some of you are already picking out. Here at the beginning, this is the post-9-11 period, after the attacks. Our image was actually pretty good in all of those countries until we launched the war on terror. By the time President Obama was being elected in 2008, taking office in 2009, it's kind of a stunning improvement in the image of the United States around the world. I remember traveling after the, before and after the 2004 election in the United States. I was with students in Argentina uh, just before the election, and I was in Europe just after the election. And I remember before the election, people that our students talked to and I talked to routinely thought that the United States, that you, you and I, Americans, would fix the problem of the Iraq invasion by electing a different president in 2004. After the 2004 election, I remember people saying, oh, oh, you actually didn't think there was a problem to be fixed. So our perception of you is correct. You actually supported that invasion, which most of the rest of the world did not support. And here at the end, uh, this is 2012, and these numbers have stayed pretty stable uh, between 2012 and now. We don't have any numbers for 2015 yet. Uh, we do have 13 and 14, and they're about the same. Our uh, image has drifted off again a bit. The separation with the Muslim world, though, is the really dramatic part of it. And take a look at the same chart, now focusing on the Arab and Muslim world. All of these countries are either Muslim countries, like Indonesia, the most populous Muslim country in the world, or uh, other Muslim countries or Arab countries in the world. Uh, Iran is not on this list. That's not an Arab country. Here's Indonesia. Took a nosedive after the 9-11 attacks. There were demonstrations against the U.S. in Indonesia after the 9-11 attacks. Boosted during Obama's election. Back down a little bit again. Lebanon. Here is Jordan. Pakistan, Turkey, and Egypt, all at the bottom of the barrel. So if you had to characterize our relationship with the Middle East on the basis only of perceptions, <coughs> it would be easy to do. <coughs> There's the bump. <coughs> Excuse me. Notice the bump in the Obama election does not occur in the Arab world, right? A slight lift in the Arab world. Can you see that? Obama gave a speech in Cairo in 2009 in which he reached out to the Muslim world. That caused a slight rise in public opinion, improvement in public opinion, but it didn't last. Pretty soon they realized that Obama was not a Muslim, that despite his middle name, and that he wasn't going to change American policy in any substantial way. And they kept their opinion of us the way it was. Okay, sorry. In 2007, we were at the bottom of the barrel. This was the worst period. Things have improved since 2007, not that much. But take a look at this. What do you think of U.S. influence in the world? Negative? or positive. Same, same uh, organizations taking the surveys. In this case, it was done under a broader coalition that reached more countries called Globescan. The yellow line is the majority line. That's the 50% mark. Only three countries in the world had majority of their citizens believing our influence in the world was good. And here's the bad news. There's the 50% mark. Look how many countries on this list in how many countries on this list, a majority of citizens think our influence in the world is negative. Again, I'm not saying our influence is negative. I'm saying people's perceptions of us. We think of ourselves as helping out when the tsunami hits. They think of us as having a negative influence on the world. Here's how even in the United States in 2007, just under a majority, 49% of Americans thought we had a negative influence. There's the Arab world and Muslim world. 
Turkey, Egypt, Lebanon, and the UAE, right, in the Middle East. And here's Germany and France, two of our best friends in the world. Hey, come on, you'd at least think your friends would be on your side, but not necessarily, not in this case. I'm going to move ahead. So how do we portray ourselves in the world? Here's how we do it. This is what we think we like to, we want others to think of us. Mickey Mouse, gamblers, old people sitting around a poker table, your, your kid brother playing video games, Madonna. It's tough security at the U.S. Capitol. You can't even get into the home of democracy. Yes, a lot of innovation, a lot of freedom to create free enterprise, etc. Of course, American Idol. But here's the image that we ourselves choose to portray abroad in many cases. Coincidentally, I was in Singapore and New York in the fall of 2006. Singapore, for those of you who don't know, is in Asia, a tiny little country, very wealthy. Uh, it's, it's just really one city with a few suburbs. Very gleaming, modern uh, country. It's not a, not a backward country and definitely not third world. And of course, you all know what New York is. I don't have to describe that. In Singapore, I went into a shopping mall where there's a deli called New York, New York. There's a Hallmark store and a Subway and a Burger King. And I just wanted to show you that to show you that the Singaporeans know very well who we are and what our products are and our brand names and all that. No, no mystery there, right? In the mall, there are some names that we're not familiar with. 20% of the population in Singapore is Muslim, like this woman walking in the shopping mall. 20%. That's approximately as many as we have Hispanics in the United States. So if you think about the fact that when you walk into a Lowe's or Home Depot store here in the U.S., you'll see English signs for hardware and then the Spanish word for hardware. When we have a 20% minority in an area, we tend to cater to that minority. We tend to do things that help them out. In this shopping mall, there was a Johnny Rocket, uh, but it wasn't called Johnny Rocket in this mall. It was called Billy Bomber. Now, that's not a coincidence. They didn't choose the word bomber just because it alliterated with Billy. That's our image. And I know you probably can't read it, but it says American Diner under there, right? As if to drive home the point. If you want something American, it's a bomber. It's about bombers, okay? In New York, at the same time, I came across these ads from Calvin Klein. Now, I don't think anybody in this room would characterize these ads as maybe not even sexy, certainly not pornographic. I mean, these two have something going on, but it's not very apparent, not very obvious, not very explicit. Calvin Klein, at the same moment in Singapore, at that same mall, this is the Calvin Klein advertising campaign that's going on in a country that's 20% Muslim. This is what we, our companies, our brands are choosing to portray ourselves like in a country that's got a substantial Muslim minority. These are not small pictures. They're bigger than life size. And I venture to guess, you could correct me if I'm wrong, that if you went to the mall here in Salisbury and you saw these pictures there, there would be letters to the editor or letters to the mayor or something complaining that you can't even take your kid sister to the mall anymore because of the pornographic images on the wall from the advertisement. And if you think I'm exaggerating here, get a load of this. Calvin Klein had a store in that mall where on the wall was this image. Hopefully I don't have to describe it to you verbally, you can see it. If you saw that in the mall here in Salisbury, a man and a woman wearing nothing but their underwear, engaged in some activity that we probably all know what it is, I think you would say, wait, you can't advertise that way. That's not right. This is how we are perceived and portrayed around the world. 
As a result, not everybody likes our popular culture. Look at the way the Arab world and the Muslim world, and add Russia and China, feel about our music, movies, and television. Yeah, they listen, but they don't necessarily like it. A final story, and then I'll uh, invite questions from you if you wish. Who can finish the sentence about Superman? Truth, justice, and... All right, was there anybody under the age of 50 who answered that question? Raise your hand. Anybody under the age of 50? Did you know what the answer was? All right, so there's the generation gap, right? Those of us over the age of 50 know that the story of Superman involves him fighting for truth, justice, and the American way. And we like that story. We, watched, we read the comics. We watched two or three movies that were Superman, including one that celebrated a big debut in Paris a few years ago. Uh, they did a whole promotional campaign with Superman flying around the Eiffel Tower and so on and so forth. But the producers of Superman 2, the movie, in 2006, 2006, this is after 9-11, after the invasion of Iraq, when they came to that line in the movie, they blocked it out. No, no, so nobody censored it. The producers of the movie themselves made the background sound come up so loud that you couldn't hear the phrase, the American way. Why? Because the American way in 2006 was not something people around the world were going to buy tickets to Superman movie to go and see. The American way was not respected in 2006. It had reached the point where Hollywood was censoring its own movies because of our perception of uh, uh, in the world. And other pieces of our pop culture are banned widely in the Arab and Muslim world. The Da Vinci Code is considered anti-Christian. The West Wing, which some of you may remember, a long seven-year um, uh, TV series about uh, politics in Washington and the White House is perceived as anti-Arab. The website Flickr was banned when I had my class with the United Arab Emirates it's also banned in Iran and Saudi Arabia because it contains what they consider pornographic images. So they, when you go to Flickr in the UAE, you get this screen, which essentially says, forget about it, you can't see this, the government won't let you see it, it's censored. Here in the United States, the Al Jazeera Arabic language television network is effectively banned. Most of you can't receive it on your cable systems, and if you can receive it, you don't even know it's there most of the time, it's perceived as anti-American and was actually portrayed that way by the U.S. government in the mid-2000s. And finally, come with me to South Africa alongside a superhighway and see this billboard. Mercedes, the company that makes the smart car, was advertising the smart car with a positive set of attributes. It has German engineering, Swiss innovation, and it has nothing to do with America. You can buy this car, it's okay, because it has nothing American about it. Think about how insulting that is to us. Now that's South Africa, that's not the Arab and Muslim world. People could sell cars on the negative image of the United States. That's what this story really means. By the way, the footnote to this story is that Chrysler workers, who at that moment in 2006 were owned by Mercedes, not anymore, but they were at that time, Chrysler workers raised their hands and said, wait a minute, wait a minute, we're part of your company. We make Mercedes cars too. How can you have that billboard? Mercedes apologized and about six weeks later took the billboard, billboard down. But the mere idea that an ad person would think you can sell cars on the negative image of the United States shows you how bad it is. Let me conclude by just answering the question briefly about does it matter? Because I think by now, and I have more examples that I won't go into, but I think by now you're, some of you are thinking, who cares what they think? We are who we are. We have a right to be who we are, and we do. We have a right to make our own decisions about how we behave around the world, and we do. So what difference does it make? 
what they think of us. Do we have to hold a popularity poll contest around the world to see how good we are? Well, think about the next time you go to an airport and you're standing in line and you have to take your shoes off and maybe your belt and you have to practically undress to go through the magnetometers and you look around you and you see dozens at one airport but thousands across the country of TSA workers who are all there created an infrastructure of security at airports alone, just this one sector of our economy, where an infrastructure of security was built with billions of dollars and thousands and thousands of employees who do non-productive work. They're not making anything. They're not producing anything. They're not building roads. They're not building buildings. They're not selling houses. They're not making software. They're not doing anything. They're standing there to prevent you from carrying a weapon onto an airplane or prevent somebody else from doing that. That's an aftermath of our image around the world. And you know what the irony is? All the people who come to the United States from other parts of the world have to go through that too, and that simply adds to our negative image. Why do we have to do this? We have to do it because somebody in Saudi Arabia named Osama bin Laden had a bad image of the United States. He was able to rally the support of enough people to bring down the World Trade Centers, part of the Pentagon, and an airplane over Pennsylvania. Not to mention all those attacks I showed you at the beginning of the presentation that occurred around the world in the Arab and Muslim world against American interests, economic, political, military. Those are the prices we pay for our negative perception abroad. It's why it matters. Can we do anything about it? I would say the better question to ask is should we do anything about it? And I won't argue with you that we should change our policies in order to satisfy people who don't even vote for the American government. We should all vote. That's a whole separate issue. We don't. We should. But we certainly shouldn't take a a survey outside the United States and ask what should the United States do and then we should do what everybody else says. No, I'm not arguing that. I would never argue that. We have to make our own policy. We have to make our own decisions. When we decide to go to war, we have to do it on the basis of our own interests. But, and here's the main point I think that I'm trying to make with you tonight, we cannot afford to wear blinders and pretend that the image we have of ourselves is the one we have around the world. We can't afford that. It costs us lives, it costs us money, and it's going to have a payback, a negative payback, in the future. So we should be thinking hard about the public images we purvey around the world. Who are we? What is our advertising? Are we sensitive to other cultures when we advertise in other cultures? Are we sensitive when we send our troops ab abroad? to the beliefs and sensitivities of others. If we think it's the right thing we do to do, we've got to do it. But I would argue we can do it in a way that is more sensitive to our image outside the United States. Again, I want to thank you very, very much for coming out tonight. I told you this was not going to be easy, but I hope that some of you at least leave tonight thinking, I hadn't thought about it that way, and that you perhaps find a way to think about it in the future.